The climate is changing. Oceans are warming. Extreme weather is more common. Threatened species are under strain. Whether we accept it or not, it's happening. What we might do about it is up to us. We're on borrowed time. I'm Andrew Murphy of the Mill Valley Public Library. I'm here today recording an episode for the Borrow Time series. Marco Rocks is an author and journalist whose writings on California and the West have received numerous awards for literary nonfiction. A former staffer at the Los Angeles Times, his work has appeared in the New York Times and the California Sunday Magazine. His books include In My Father's Name, a memoir of his father's murder, a collection of essays about the West titled West of the West, and the best-selling King of California, which won a California Book Award and the William Sarayan Prize from Stanford University. Most recently, Rx has written The Dreamt Land, which is what we'll be discussing today. The Dreamt Land focuses on flood and drought in California. I've asked Mark to begin by reading a passage from his book, which is an old one too saying. The white man makes too many demands of the earth. He stretches it too thin. Cracks will open up in the ground and swallow him up. The spirit of the land will strike back, first drought, then flood. When the Indians all die, then God will let the water come down from the north. Everyone will drown. The white people dig deep, long tunnels. Eventually, the water will come. Thanks. And um, I asked you to share that because it's included in your book about 500 pages in. And when I read it, it just struck me because it seemed to capture everything you reveal in your book through the varied histories and explanations of water and drought issues related to agriculture and just in general, the ecosystem of California. And throughout the book, you remind the readers that drought and flood are part of the natural ecosystem of California. Um, But for the sake of our listeners that have not yet read your book, do you mind sharing some of the background info about the white man's demand of the earth in California, uh, beginning either with John Sutter or perhaps even with the wind too? So... um This book begins in present day during a historic drought. And then at some point, uh, about five chapters in, I say to understand this place, this kind of madness of extraction, I have to go back. So how far back do we go? My editor said, well, go back to the gold rush. That's a logical place to begin. I mean, what was the mining of gold, if not the mining of water first? And I thought, no, no, no. There was something else, another resource that was taken before water was taken to mine gold. And that was the resource, the body, the actual body of the native. We had more, uh, our, our concentration of native uh, in California was the highest of anywhere in North America. There were 300,000 natives. And unlike the Cherokee and the Sioux and the, and, 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 and the tribes of, of the Southwest and the Midwest, um, the California tribes weren't fighting over resources. They weren't warlike. They didn't have to be. There was an abundance in California, so they lived more or less in peace, 300,000 of them. Um, when Father Sarah and, and, the, and, 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 the, and the Franciscans came up from Mexico into San Diego and then started that experiment of the missions up and down California, they took the body of the Indian, the first resource, and it was through that taking that they were able to then bend the rivers, build the first dams and canals. So that's where I begin this historical, you know, look back at at the seeds of of extraction. And then, um, you know, that taking of the body of the Indian then leads to um, these, these men coming from Europe who were reinventing themselves. California was a perfect place to do that. And the father of of the uh, of 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 California um, was uh, you know was John Sutter, a fugitive from Switzerland, who comes at a time when California is run at least nominally run by by um, um, uh, the the Mexicans, and he goes to Monterey where the governor is, and this governor thinks, oh no, here comes another white guy just like the Russians. He wants land along the the beautiful coast. Sutter says, no, no, no. I want to go to the interior of California, the land of the Tulis. And he says, go ahead. 
if you can tame the last remaining tribes of Indians, that would be even better. Come back to me after you've settled. And if, if the experiment's gone well, I will grant you a huge, huge deed of land. Sutter goes into the interior. He gets lost in the Thule's. He's found what he thinks is a Sacramento River. It's the San Joaquin. When he finds that Sacramento River, he decides that he's going to plant his new empire. He called it New Helvetia, Sutterville, Sacramento, whatever you want to call it. But he planted it at the confluence of the Sacramento River and the American River, the worst floodplain in all of California. So there you see the original sin of California. Man, white man, plants his flag right there where two rivers are going to flood. And so begins the defiance of nature. And even before the gold rush, he attempted to manage the rivers as well, right? Or at least his, the people he oversaw, I should say. Yeah, no, his, his managing of those rivers is what unearthed the first gold. Remember, it was one of the guys working at Sutter's Fort, mm -hmm. Marshall, who found the gold in the American River, came back and told Sutter. And they swore themselves to a secret. What they did know that some Mormon immigrants who were staying at Sutter's Fort had overheard their conversation. And so the word about gold got spread to the world through a Mormon, um, and, um, uh, through a Mormon who went to San Francisco and basically said, gold, gold, gold. And if I remember correctly, I think it was only 2006 where it seemed all the residue from the gold mines back then are only now finally clear of the water. Is that right? It's a great question. Yeah. It was in the flood of 1996, 97, where the last plug of those sediments from the, from the mining actually cleared and came down through the Sacramento and out to the ocean. It took that long. Yeah, I, it just struck me, like, again, in relation to climate change, just our actions today leave such a big footprint. Absolutely. That just stuck out at me for that reason. Um, regarding, um, again, man's uh, impact on nature and beginning with the Indians, um, do you mind talking a little bit about the Tulare Lake? Because I don't think a lot of people even know that it ever existed. I didn't know it existed. I mean, it was in my backyard growing up in Fresno, Tulare Lake. Tulare Lake, um, well, it was in the flood again of 1996-97, or was it 97-98? I get those mixed up sometime. But um, I got a call from uh, my colleague at the LA Times in Sacramento, a guy named Dan Moraine, and he said, Mark, Tulare Lake has come back to life. And I said, Tulare Lake? What the hell's Tulare Lake? He says, get your map out. So I got a map out. He said, trace your finger down to Corcoran. And I did. And there on the map, painted in blue, was a lake. Only it was square, perfectly square. Obviously, that's not how nature designed it. That's what man, man put the straight jacket on that lake. So I drove the next day out there, past all these farms, up to these levees, these huge levees, and I climbed up. And what, what, what had been cotton ground just a couple days before, because of the flood waters coming through the four or five rivers that ran into that old lake basin, the lake had come back, not as it was in pre-settlement days. It was 800 square miles in pre-settlement days. The Tulare Lake was the largest feature, the most dominant feature on the California map. But here in 1997, 98, a piece of it had come back. And there I saw that. And that gave rise to a book called The King of California. Um, the cotton giants who came from the south, Georgia and Mississippi, in the 1900s, chased out by the boll weevil. They landed west into this Tulare Lake basin, and they ended up draining that lake dry, turning back its rivers, okay, damming them, and creating the biggest cotton patch in the world, you know. And they brought their southern cotton plantation culture to the middle of California. Growing up, I always wondered why the middle of California, my place, felt like the South, even the accents on the tongue. And this explained it. The Dust Bowl migration that came to California, but also that preceded that were these southern plantation owners who came to California, the middle of California, and began a new cotton plantation. And just the other day, actually, the New York Times featured an article, I'm sure you saw it, the title was How Racism Ripples Through Rural California's Pipes. 
And I've seen you interview a woman in the Lost Hills and comment that, you know, there's plenty of water around her, her running to wonderful, uh, but her drinking water is poisoned. Yeah. And I guess um, I'm curious to hear your impression of how people that live in current conditions like that with arsenic in their water while, you know, the neighboring farms are growing pomegranates, how they accept that reality and right. how they just um, cope with it. Yeah. That piece you mentioned, um, that was, uh, that, that journalist was um, turned on to that story by all my stories before that um, on the Black Okies who'd come west to follow the cotton trail. And then he took a look at what's happened to these communities in the, in the middle of California where the, the African Americans were locked out of uh, the cities by racism. So all they had was a choice to basically build shacks in the, in the middle of this alkali desert and no running water. They would go fetch their water by pail. Um, in some cases, it's not so much more advanced than that, how it was in the 40s and 50s. And there are hundreds of thousands of, um, if not close to a million Californians, without drinkable water. And, uh, you know, we're trying to deal with that now through the legislature and, and some funding and all of that. But it's just it's just it's just a reminder that the capture of water that it has created the people who capture that water and move it that has been um, you know a piece of creating this kind of unequal society in California you know there's this great great um, gap between you know rich and poor and a lot of that has to do with water and the movement of it um where water is where it's moved to who owns that water it's supposed to be a public resource we all own it but in fact in reality it's been captured it's being sold it's being bartered it's being hogged <laughs> you know all those things and i mean i suppose in one way the answer is a little obvious but why aren't people more aware of this like, you know, water running through the backyard, but people can't drink it. You, you know, it's, it's a, that's a interesting observation. Water is one of those things that's all around us. I mean, it's raining today, right? Uh, it's something we take for granted except when drought comes, and then we all of a sudden notice that it's not there. Um, and then we may pass some laws. You know, nothing gets done on the water unless it's drought time. Then we start doing things. You know, should we build a new dam? Uh, do we put low flow toilets in, you know, all these kinds of things. So I, I don't know what it is, um, about our, um, ignorance of nature. I mean, Steinbeck, I think once wrote that no one forgets a drought faster than Californians and no one forgets a drought faster than the farmers of California, you know, um, out of this historic drought, what, what should have been the lesson? The lesson should have been, well, maybe we ought to be a little bit more careful about planting houses um, in a sprawl like pattern. And maybe we ought to slow down our growth of farmland. Uh, the actual opposite happened coming out of this last drought. We have planted hundreds of thousands of new acres of permanent crops. And right now we are building thousands of houses in the path of wildfire. Okay. So we don't seem to learn any lesson in California. Um, and you wonder now that climate, if climate change hitches on to California's own inherent volatile climates, you know, bringing havocs we've never seen before, you're wondering if people will indeed maybe heed a lesson or two to not grow the way we've been growing. Um, one of the people featured in your book, I hope I'm going to say his name correctly, Vitovich. Yes. He said that big agriculture can't continue, even though he's big agriculture farmer. Yeah. Uh, do you agree? I mean... Well, Vitovich is an interesting character. He, he, he made, uh, his family made um, millions and millions of dollars in Silicon Valley, developing it from farmland into what it is today. He decided that he wanted to go conquer another place. So he came up and over the mountain into the San Joaquin Valley and started buying up a lot of farmland. But his, his goal wasn't necessarily to farm it long term. It was to take the water rights associated with it, move that water around, sell it, and end selling it to the city. Uh, not unlike the movie Chinatown and, and the whole story of L.A. and, 
you know, going up and over the mountain to take Owens Valley water. So Vidovich then teams up with another a true billionaire, you know, named Stuart Resnick, who is the biggest farmer in America. And his feature in my book, he's, you know, there's probably more pages devoted to the Resnick story than anyone. And they team up in drought to try to find water where no water can be found. And they end up pumping it out of the ground two counties away. And through this elaborate system of, of ditches and pipes, they move that water. And Vidovich ends up selling that water to Resnick so he can keep alive his pomegranates, pistachios, almonds, and mandarins. So yeah, it's 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 quite quite a story. Yeah, that was the big reveal of the book to me was that he was selling water to the cities, which seemed right, right, right. Um, well, I mean, I've heard you comment on that too that you're kind of opposed to the practice of that. Yeah, I, I think um, we we the citizens of California basically said a hundred years ago when the mining of gold gave way to the mining of soil, that we were going to allow the farmers through a variety of means, riparian law, appropriative law, rights, to take the water and use it for to grow food. It seemed like a beneficial thing for all of us. But now that's become perverted. And if the farmer ends up taking that water and selling it to the city and then following the ground, um, it seems like it's a different purpose. And um, I think it's something that it's a re- it's, it's something that we ought to proceed with 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 a great deal of caution. Um, I, the last thing I want to see is the San Joaquin Valley, the richest farm land in the world, paved over by houses and mini malls. Do you have a feeling of what the future for the Central Valley looks like on that? I, I fear that very future. California has has been unable to protect its farmland. Um, you know, I mean, look at Pasadena, look at, uh, um, you know, all of LA County, what's happened to it. Look at the San Fernando Valley. So the last Valley is the central Valley and what's going to become of it. That's the, one of the great questions of California today. When I was driving through the San Joaquin Valley up here to Mill Valley, um, I passed these developments that were along I-5 where, where it was just farmland before. There was a town, there's a town called Patterson. Patterson was the apricot capital of the world. Today, you'd be very hard pressed to find any apricots there. What you're finding now is growing up and out of the ground are these very ugly suburban tracks right there along I-5. That way people can live there and have a shorter commute to the Silicon Valley where their jobs are. So will the San Joaquin Valley and its farmland be converted into suburbia to serve the Silicon Valley and LA and San Francisco? This is the great question facing this state. Well, I'm going to come back to apricots, but on this note of growth, um, you know, your book mentions more than once that when you were born, 14 million people lived here. There's now 40. And uh, at some point in your book, you do make a comparison between population growth and agricultural growth. Um, Neither, presumably, are sustainable. Um, So, I guess I'm just curious, like, what do you, what gives you hope with these concerns in mind? I'm hoping that climate change, the awareness of climate change, the need to do something on the ground that mitigates against the consequences of climate change will somehow change our notion of growth here. Uh, and now it's a tough, I mean, it's really hard baked into us from the very beginning, the gold rush the modern beginning of California, we grew in a supercharged way. Overnight, 80,000 people coming through San Francisco to go to the hills to get their riches. And that gold rush mentality has not left us today. Um, So I'm hoping that with the awareness of climate change, folks start asking, well, wait a second. Um, We have 40 million people now uh, sucking off a system, a, a water delivery system, that was initially designed for 11 to 12 million people. The system's cracking. It's not going to see us into a future of more nut trees and more houses. One of those things is going to have to give. What is going to give? And with climate change, can we continue to build houses in the wildland urban interface? I mean, you know, I'm driving up 
here and, and, and there's a lot of woodlands here. There are houses in these woodlands. And I think it was in the 1920s, maybe the 19 teens, that there was a fire that came through Mill Valley. So we are thumbing our nose at nature. And it's, it's, it's hard um, not to believe that nature will have a kind of last word and is already having a last word. So that's what gives me some hope that these new challenges will get us to rethink our model of sprawl, both as a way to grow farmland and as a way to grow suburbia. Um, Your book opens with your personal story of growing apricots and them blossoming in January. And you called your neighbor Brad, who grows pistachios, and he had some problems on his farm, and he said climate change was responsible. And you seemed a little surprised that he was willing to acknowledge that. Yeah, farmers don't usually utter those words, global climate change. Um, so with, you know, the, the previous question in mind with hope and all those changes, um, how do you see a, a future of recognizing the models not sustainable if at the ground level, the farmers are acknowledging climate change? Yeah. Well, if, if we can get farmers to acknowledge climate change, that's, that's huge. That's big. If there are more brads out there, then we're, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, um, this book begins with my three apricot trees in the backyard. They happen to blossom in the middle of drought on a, an early day in January, which is I've never seen before. That's like four weeks. I mean, what to call? Yeah, it's, not, that's, it's not spring, right? Um, and so Brad comes over. All my apricots have shed, and by March, they're, they're all on the ground. Something weird's happening, and we go out to his pistachio orchard. And I see a connection between what's happening to his pistachios and, and my and my apricots. And Brad says it's global climate change. We did not have enough chill over winter, enough chilling hours over winter to put our trees to sleep. And a tree has to go to sleep. It has to know, as my grandfather used to tell me, my grandfather R.M. Arox, the poet, he would say, that a tree has to know the kiss of death in winter to be able to hold on to life in spring. Well, my apricots all shed. And Brad's pistachios, the males and females, their fertilization was completely off. And so that's what we're seeing now. And I, I, my, my hope is, is that as we are confronting more of that, that it starts changing the way we're doing things on the ground. Right now, another thing that gives me hope to answer your question is that after 165 years, California, which has this image of being overregulated and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know and, and environmentally progressive, but it took us 165 years to regulate the taking of groundwater. We're one of the last states to do that. But now that we're going to regulate it because we were taking so much groundwater, the land was sinking and the infrastructure of California was sinking along with the land. But now that we're going to regulate it, we might have a chance to, to follow some farmland that should have never been developed in the first place because it was such poor ground. And so I'm hoping that, that the state gets more involved in the regulation of land use. The locals will bridle against that. and They will, they will not want that to happen. But I don't think we can trust the locals on these growth issues um, you saw what happened up in Paradise, that, that town that burned off, nearly burned off the California map. We planted that county, that, that little town of Paradise, through their land use decisions, planted 40,000 people, on which, which is essentially a geologic chimney. Fire came through, no surprise. So, um, we we got to change the way we're growing California. And one of the um, central debates with water usage today, especially during a drought year, is um, the protection of the Delta smelt. And in your book, you also comment on the history of the Central Valley used to be home to wild grizzlies, wild mustangs, antelope. And uh, I guess I'm just curious, what is your personal opinion about preserving the delta smelt well the delta smelt smelt is 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 you know to borrow a cliche it's just the canary in the coal mine it's our warning 
um, we have altered the environment. The San Joaquin Valley um, geologists have, have, have determined that it's the most altered landscape by the hand of human in history. Okay. It was desert and marsh, and now it's became, become the most fertile farmland anywhere. Well, that, that took an incredible amount of manipulation, bending, bending, bending soil, bending water, bending man, importing labor, all the bending chemical, bending the path of bees to pollinate the orchards. It's all a massive manipulation. The Delta itself is a very manipulated environment. And the Delta we now count on to send water to, you know, 20 million Californians, if not more. Um, the Delta's tired. It's tired of serving that burden. Something again has to give. Um, are we going to see, say goodbye to the, the, the salmon and the smelt and, and the other indigenous species of the Delta, the same way we said goodbye to the Indian? Or are we going to find a way to preserve that and maybe... Uh, temper our 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 no, notions of growth, 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 growth. I was impressed by your writing that presented the information that lets the reader infer what they want, and make their own judgment. Because the people you write about are your neighbors. Yeah. But I'm curious um, when you go shopping at the grocery store, do you think about what you're buying and where it's coming from because you know who grew it? And does oh it, yeah. No, I, I, I can source back vegetables, fruits to, to the very orchards where they come from. So, yeah, no, we're aware. Uh, I've made my children kind of hyper aware of some of those things. Um, but you ask something inside that question is, is another question, um, which is, how is it to write about your place, to tell on your neighbors, to hang out your dirty laundry? Uh, it's tough to do. It really is, and some, and some, and sometimes the consequence is, is you become um, a persona non grata in your own, your own place. Um, I try to be fair. Um, I don't tell this story from a distance. I start in my own backyard. My own family story is woven through this book. Okay, this is not a dry. Uh, water geeks water book okay this is a story i've tried to make it into literature if it doesn't sound too highfalutin uh, the writing of it okay the storytelling i don't want to tell stories i don't want to bring a lot of judgment to it i want to reveal the complexity of the land the complexity of the people and give the reader credit to draw their own you know conclusions from it it doesn't mean i pull punches and step away from judgment it's just that I don't want to present people as cardboard figures. And so even Stuart Resnick, so many people want to demonize Resnick because he's the biggest. And he's dared to call his company the wonderful company, right? But even there, I try to present him in a nuanced, you know, kind of complex way with all the shadings that we all have, all the flaws. Um, and the Resnicks, they do perhaps... Uh, as a reaction anyway, they do make an effort to, at least in appearances, um, offer health incentives and do good for the community, at least in appearances again. Um, but what I, as a reader, can't tell from that is... Um, what the motivation is? Not no. the motivation. Maybe that comes through, but more how the people that live there feel about it. So... The Resnicks, it took them 30 years. They, they live in Beverly Hills. And if you come up and over the mountain into the San Joaquin Valley in Kern County, outside of Bakersfield, they, their company town is called Lost Hills. And for 30 years of farming, they never really did much for Lost Hills. But then a light bulb went on. And who knows if it's guilt or whatever. I mean, I, my answer is if we didn't have guilt of the wealthy, we wouldn't have any libraries in, in America, right? So they end up starting to give back to these communities, doing a kind of philanthropy that no agricultural entity has ever done. Building charter schools, putting people on health programs, trying to tackle diabetes, which is a real killer, obesity in the valley, trying to change the, the, the Mexican farm workers' diet. And some of this is social engineering. I mean, Linda Resnick, the brander of palm juice and all that other stuff, She's come in and she's trying to persuade their farm worker families from Mexico that they should not be eating flour tortillas, corn tortillas, if any kind of tortilla, is what she says. Now, 
they're not, she's just not writing these checks for tens of millions of dollars to do this philanthropy. She's designing the very programs to try to get them to lose weight, the exercise programs, hiring the doctors and dietitians, and then also writing the, uh, designing the schools to try to reach these kids. Um, you know, so it's something to admire. It's something to um, add to the portrait of, of these two people. And uh, the people that work for them... Um, oh, know, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I dodged your question, didn't no, I? No, you didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, because I was more talking about the community, or yeah. was asking about the community, but I'm also curious about their staff, because yeah, um, the, they seem to tip you off, like, here's where you need to look. And Yeah, the, the, the people there are appreciative of what the residents have brought to their community, okay? Uh, new roads. The kids don't have to walk to school in the mud when it's raining or the, or the dust dust when it's, you know, the dead of summer. Um, they have new parks there. Uh, they've provided a good paying jobs with benefits. So they're appreciative of that. Yes, they are. Um, the workforce is mostly um, uh, undocumented. Um, and so because of that, the, the Resnicks are kind of the ultimate power in those places. So it's a very complex relationship that I tried to explore. You know, a lot of this book is on the ground with farm workers, too. Um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's all over the place. I remember doing a story on farm workers who couldn't make ends meet, so they started cooking methamphetamine. And Bruce Springsteen was happened to be in L.A. and read the story and wrote a song about it for one of his albums called The Ghost of Tom Joad. And he came to Fresno to give a concert. And I, I got invited to it because I was the inspiration for one of the songs, right? At least my story was. And in that concert, he took a break and said, uh, this is a song I want to dedicate to the, the men and women who pick our crops and all this. And people started grumbling. And then at the, toward the end of the concert, he said, I've set up a piggy bank outside. I'd love for you to donate. All that money will go to farm worker communities. So when I went backstage to meet him, he looked at me and he said, what kind of place is this? And I said, what do you mean? He says, I just heard back from one of my assistants that, uh, well, he had. He'd just been told by one of his assistants right there that not a single penny had been put in that piggy bank. So it's a really complex place to understand um, the, the middle of California. And, and that's what I've tried to do here as I've taken on the entire state, trying to understand it as well. And you do a great job. And although the book is over 500 pages, you could have gone in so many additional oh, trust directions. Me. <laughs> trust me, I did. It, there, this book is uh, 200,000 words. It was 240,000 words before I cut it. Um, I like to believe, you know, some people are telling me, that was a page turner. I, I read it in four or five days. I said, my goodness, it took me four or five years to write it. Please take some more time. Um, you know, some people love the history section the best. Some people don't like the history section so much. They love the modern day when I'm out on the land with these farmers seeing what's going on. Um, I, I thought that all of that had to, be, had to be brought to bear with really good writing to keep people engaged. And I wasn't writing for necessarily the water community or even California. I was writing this for the nation to understand what kind of manipulation took place here to create this, this place, California. And it's still taking place. Oh, yes. Um, I'm also curious because, you know, you, you kind of focus on the big farmers, which makes sense. But I'm curious, just because I don't know, what, uh, how common are smaller farms? Smaller farms, yeah. So we have, you know, for, for instance, John Kirkpatrick in here, the citrus grower on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley who grows those citrons. And he gets paid sometimes $80, $90 a citron because those citrons are holy to Orthodox Jews who celebrate this one uh, traditional kind of holiday festival and use the citron as one of the central things of it. Small guy, he's only got 20, 30 acres. There are other small farmers in there. There's a, there's a guy named Richard Hagopian who plays that Arab guitar called the Oud. And he's like one of the last of the raisin growers in this particular part of the valley. So I try to move in and out between big and small to give a sense of the differences. The small guy, he can't go so deep into the ground 
to extract groundwater. So he counts on the snow melt coming down the rivers and the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project if he's so located to bring him his water. But that water then ends up drying up in drought. So I'm, so I'm trying to see it through the lens of both big and small. And um, I guess what I didn't take away was the perhaps competition, if you will, between the small and large. Is there resentment or is it not at all? The big guy is going to swallow up the small guy. He's been doing it for a century, and pretty soon he'll do it to the extent that uh, the small guy won't be around anymore. And now we're getting all this hedge fund money, pension fund money, uh, the f- money from Canada, you know, the, the, the Royal Mounties, their, their, reti- their pension funds coming in, and they're all investing in farmland. I think it's a play for the water, really. And so we're seeing more and more of a concentration of ownership in hands that aren't small farmer, aren't even big farmer in California. They're, they're concentrated in investment hands. And uh, you note in your book that uh, you feel people in San Francisco and Los Angeles don't know where their water is coming from. And one of the things you do touch on in the book that um, a direction that you could have gone that didn't quite go up, it's not the focus of your boy book was like Napa Valley and how I believe there's one hill where Governor Newsom That's and right. that, multiple celebrities have. Yeah, figured. and I talk about that at the end of that book in Holy Water where the, that, that mountain is literally sliding into the Napa River. And they're taking now, I mean, how many more vineyards and, and, and um, you know, boutique wineries and um, hotels and things like that can you build really up there? Um, here in Mill Valley, you know, you guys are unique. There's only probably three, four places in the state of California, Mount Shasta. There's some here and there, probably maybe more than three, but let's say a dozen places that have their own watershed. Okay. You guys aren't reliant on the Central Valley projects or the state water project. You've got, you know, I don't know how much of your, of your, of your water that comes out of your taps comes from your local sources, but I, I venture it's quite a bit. So your dynamic and your relationship to the water is a little different, I would say healthier. Although I'm not sure you should be building more houses in the woodlands <laughs> because of it. Yes. I guess just one final question. I'm curious uh, for the farmers in the Central Valley in drought, is there like awareness and opinions about the water at Mount Shasta being sold to Nestle and... Like knowing just like I don't thinking. think there was. I, that's I, that's why I felt that was important to to have in 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 the book was was taking a look, going up to the source, the holy water. Um, I think Joan Didion first called it holy water, but I don't think it was in reference to Mount Shasta. There's actually you know Buddhists and all sorts of believers up there in Mount Shasta who live there because of that water, how pristine it is, and to see it being bottled and sold by Nestle and Crystal Geyser and all the rest. Um, in other, I think mean, there's a Japanese conglomerate in there too, um, is, is disconcerting. Um, so yeah. And, 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 and at the book, at the end of the book, I'm on the land with a farmer who really, I call him the Oracle cause he's so smart and so far seeing. And as we're leaving this piece of ground and, he, and he's dissected the whole problem of California in, in a way that he could distilled it. Um, uh, we we he says let's let's figure this thing out let's get a solution and so we write out ten things that kind of um, I don't think you could write a book like this and not at least offer some ways out of out of this you know these water wars endless water wars and out of the ten is there one that you think is the most important well I think the groundwater regulation the state has to hold the locals feet to the fire and say no your model for extraction that you've given us does not is is BS. Uh, go back, give us one that's more honest. Uh, I also think that um, we grow a lot of alfalfa and have a lot of mega dairies in the state of California. I think our land is too valuable. The water is too valuable to have support mega dairies. They pollute the groundwater and the alfalfa that they count on and the silage and corn, um, especially the alfalfa, sucks up a lot of water. So I think uh, to make cows truly happy, they probably need to get on a uh, a truck of some kind and be shipped to some other state and we'll save up some water that way. <laughs> I'm going to upset all my Dutch and Azorian Portuguese dairy farmer friends, but in, in after a glass of wine, they'll tell you the same thing. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew.
Borrowed Time is a collaborative effort by librarians to combat climate change by discussing sustainability issues and all things related to the human influence on our ecosystem. For more episodes, visit borrowed-time.org.